So I'm going to stop there and uh, introduce our guest for tonight, Dr. Chris Gardner. Chris and I have known each other for a number of years. And Chris is a nutrition scientist. He works in the Stanford Present Prevention Research Center. And he's not only a local and national, but he's actually an internationally recognized expert in nutrition and health. And I think you'll also find him a very entertaining and thoughtful speaker. We're going to learn a lot from him tonight. So without any further ado, Chris, thanks for coming. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, honored to be here. Yes, I'm totally impressed with 95% retention. So I've never achieved 95% retention, even though I have fed and bled 2,000 people in our nutrition studies, garlic, ginkgo, fish oil, weight loss diets, etc. So 95 is an incredible benchmark. I will strive to achieve what you have. So the basis of tonight's talk, um, this is supposed to be a generic talk. It's sort of about nutrition in general for everybody. And a while ago, they asked me to do one of these summer things for the hospital, uh, a Health Matters event. And it was Janet, so it's kind of based on that. And so I got a lot of topics for you. I've kind of given this talk a number of times. And I want to show you my last slide, which I've decided to start with. Because at the end, what I actually like best is taking your questions. And it's very selfish, because I always need new grant ideas. And so the grand ideas I need are the ones that you're the most confused about. And so I don't know what you're most confused about if I talk at you. So I'm going to try to, I might even go too fast in these slides. And I'm assuming that this group is going to make the slides available to you if anybody wants them. So I share them with wild abandon with anyone. Also pointing out my little Twitter bird now. This is a new thing for me. Ken, I don't know if you've done this yet, but I started tweeting lately. <laughs> The communications folks told us it's not enough to do rigorous science and publish in journals. We now have to do social media stuff. So, if anybody wants to follow me, I'm at at Gardner PhD. It's actually kind of fun. I've been messing. I don't, I don't get too caught up in it. But let's get there after picking a couple of different topics that I get a lot of questions about. And I want to point out that they're in different domains. And sort of very common domains are how much protein should I eat? And what about carbs? Should I be afraid? And then the other one is what about GMO? Should we label stuff? And is organic worth it? I really feel like those are two completely different domains of food. And I'm only bringing them up to suggest that I'm prepared to take questions sort of in both of those realms. It doesn't have to be that. It could be antibiotics for livestock. It could be global warming. It could be fish oil. So I, I've kind of got a foot in both camps right now. So I picked some topics just to stir your thought process. And um, I'm also a super informal speaker. So if I've confused you anywhere along the way, just raise your hand and feel free to ask a question. If we don't get through my slides, I don't really care. Or when we get toward the end, I'm going to flip to the end and see what kind of questions you want. You ready for this journey? OK. I don't understand why everybody's so freaking obsessed with protein. It is driving me nuts. And it is personally driving me nuts, because I've been a vegetarian for 35 years. Uh, all to get a girl 35 years ago who ditched me, and I tried to be a vegetarian to get her back, and she didn't take me back. But I decided I decided being a vegetarian was okay, and really, I actually wanted to start a vegetarian restaurant. And I got the PhD by mistake, and the millions of dollars of research funding by mistake. It kind of goes back to me being pissed that people were making fun of my amino acids. And so here it is, years later, and I totally have the science background to address this now. Are you ready? What is going on with this protein thing? Holy smokes. OK, so these are a little bit old, these data. It's a decade old. This is global data. This is 150 countries. So the x-axis, as you go this way, is countries who make more and more money. And the y-axis is they eat more and more meat. And the trend here is a lot of countries don't have a lot of money, and they don't eat a lot of meat. But as they get some more money, they eat some more meat. At some point, they just can't eat any more meat, even if they have more money, except us. <laughs> Is that how you want to make America great again? That one right there? I'm going to say no. All right? And then here's a way to frame it in terms of protein. And so um, the countries are listed on the bottom. I crossed out a line because I kind of got the, the title of this wrong. This isn't really a requirement. It has to be recommended daily allowed to protein. But nonetheless, green is plant protein and the red is animal. And as you can see, a third of the world gets almost all their protein from plants. 
but not us. We're over on the edge being great again. Just sort of eats more and more meat. If you want to update the data, here's 2018 data, same thing, global stuff. There we are on the left, and the world is in the middle, and there's a bunch of countries to the right of us, and there really is no horrific protein deficiency epidemic anywhere in these countries right now. There are certainly pockets of the world where they're not getting enough food. And then when they don't get enough food, they don't get enough protein, but it's, it's not really a protein deficiency issue, and I've got a question already. Uh, you're calling out meat, but mentioning protein, there's no mention reference to fish. Ah, excellent. So I can get to that at the end. It's actually not in any of these FAO data. So fish is an excellent topic, and if we all eat as many fish as the American Heart Association says, and Ken's part of this group too, if we really ate two servings a day, two servings a week, the entire world, we'd have no more fish in five years. So as long as only you know that we should do that, and everybody in this room, we're good. But if you tell everybody else, we're screwed. <laughs> Don't say that too loud, okay? I don't have fish data at the moment, but I'm happy to get there later. Okay, so it's not just the meat. What the heck is this? Um, I forgot to put a slide in here. I took a trip the other day, and I stopped at Starbucks. Most of you use the bathroom, but I got some coffee just to make it legit. And as I walked past the counter, they have food. Starbucks has food now. And every single item on the top said, protein 20 grams, protein 12, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, chicken salad, First word on it was protein, like protein cells. What the heck is going on? It's so obscene. I bet you've seen vitamin and mineral water. Now there's frigging protein water. Oh my God, just drink water, people. Okay, get your protein somewhere else. I'm going to show you how easy it is. It's like it's a sugar delivery system. They're giving you protein and sugar. Why? Why? God. So in my field, this goes back. 50 years ago, we figured out how much protein people needed, and the um, scientific community put together this 1,300-page tome, which talks about carbs and fats and protein, and so if you dig in there, there's hundreds of pages about protein. So let me give you some really, really decades-old data on protein that you wouldn't know, because it's so old. I actually got my PhD at Berkeley, if I'm allowed to say that, and the fifth floor of Morgan Hall is the penthouse. And back in the days of the Vietnam War, they took conscientious war objectors and they put them to live in the penthouse in the fifth floor. And they put in blue zoot suits and they lowered their protein to zero. And then they raised their protein back up and they vacuumed the blue zoot suits every day. And they took out all the feces, all the urine, all the na uh, nose blowings, hair sloughing off of skin, everything. So they could see all the protein going in and out of the person and so they were in protein balance. And they found out people need different amounts of protein. And they did this for different people. And it, it's kind of like a bell curve. So everybody needs kind of an average amount. And then there's some high and there's some low. They did figure out the average. And they put those data together in a book. And it tells you what the estimated average requirement is. Now, I bet you a lot of you have heard of the recommended daily allowance for things. So do you think the recommended daily allowance is the average? If it was the average, let's do the math here. If we recommended it and everybody today in this room got the average, how many of you would be deficient? Half, by definition, right? So in my world of nutrition, the recommended daily allowance is two standard deviations above the estimated average requirement. So another math problem. If everybody in this room today got the recommended daily allowance, how many of you would exceed your requirement? 97.5% of you, basically. That one person would get just what they needed, but everybody else would exceed it. Does that mm -hmm. make sense, right? So I got some math for you to do. Here's the estimated average requirement. Has to do with body weight. Extrapolate. They, they always do this in kilograms, and I know we're not very good at kilograms, so I put pounds down there for you. So find yourself somewhere in the middle, and then the recommended daily allowance is two standard deviations above that. And according to our national data, Americans eat twice the RDA. Oh. And then they buy protein Cheerios. And then they buy a protein bar. And then they buy protein water. And then they get a cylinder of soy protein. And as they're pumping iron, they pour pounds of protein powder. God, what is going on? OK, I got, I got a quiz for you. 
I'm going to talk about what you do with all that protein that's extra, because you do. Almost everybody eats more protein during the day than they need. Almost everyone. I guarantee it. In fact, I, I'll just give you this little tidbit. I give talks in medical conferences all the time, and I've started asking if any physicians have any vegans or vegetarians in their client practice, and they all raise their hand. I said, have any of you in your career ever treated one for protein deficiency? And they look around, so they don't. And then you see them turning around to see what one of my colleagues, none of my colleagues have either. So I'm going, it just doesn't happen. Okay, so quiz. Every day you eat carbs, fats, and proteins. That's where your calories come from. If you ate extra fat and stored it as fat, where would you store it and how much would you store it? Where would you store it? Everywhere. Your butt and your belly and your boobs and your underarms and your jowls and head. Oh, fat everywhere, all across your body, right? Unlimited, unlimited capacity for storing fat. Carbohydrates, if you ate extra carbohydrates today, where would you store it and how much? Much more limited, do you know? Skeletal muscle, one other place, your liver. So at night, when you haven't eaten for a while, sometimes your liver will share the stored glycogen and turn it into glucose, release it for your brain and central nervous system. How much can you store? Who's a runner? Who's a marathon runner? When, in the marathon, have you depleted your entire glycogen supply? Six weeks later? Four weeks later? Four hours later? It's the wall. When you hit the wall in the marathon, mile 20, that's where a lot of people, even if they've carb loaded, have exhausted their glycogen supply, right? And then they have it goo and cookies and things like that. All right, so very limited supply of carbohydrate. So this is all to lead to the point of when you eat extra protein, how much can you store and where do you store it? Did you ever think about this one? Possibly they convert it to something else. Make it to glucose, don't you? Your, your yeah. kidneys, flush it out. Yeah, there is no place to store it. It is all functional. So even though unlimited capacity for fat and smallest fast carbohydrate, none for protein. It's you're eating all that excess protein for need, beyond your need to maintain. It all just converts, it's converted to glucose and fat. First it'll go to uh, immediate brain and central nervous system needs, and then it'll go to replete glycogen. If your glycogen had run out, it'll fill it back up. And if all that's filled up, which is pretty easy to do, then it all goes to fat. But to do it, you actually have to bust off the nitrogen. The unique thing about protein is it's got an amine group on it. So you gotta bust that off. The liver turns it into ammonia and your kidney has to excrete it. And so with all this extra protein, your kidney is being taxed with this all day long. And I have some nephrologist friends, I said, God, this must be killing people with kidney disease. And they said, we kind of thought so, but it doesn't. If you really look at the data, humans are very resilient. Um, if you have impaired kidney function, one of the first things they'll have you do is cut back on your protein so that you don't further challenge your kidney. But as far as we know, these people who eat way more protein than they need, it's not causing impaired kidney function. I've asked them. I'm not a nephrologist, but I asked several colleagues, and they said, no, 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 thought so too, kind of looked at it, haven't really. <coughs> Ever seen that? So your bodies are amazing at sort of swapping back the proteins, carbs, and fats, and, and calories. But nonetheless, you're not storing it for the next day. So these folks who are like bulking up on protein, you know how you make muscle? You work out. You don't sit on the couch and drink protein water. <laughs> Does it work? You actually have to move and sweat and tear up your muscle fibers and rebuild them. Okay. So. Every five years, we updo the dietary guidelines for Americans, and they call in a dietary advisory committee to see what new data are out there. And back in 2015, when they were doing it, Bunch said, well, what new data have we got? So it kind of looks like the protein foods that people are picking are animal foods, high in saturated fat, they don't have any fiber. Boy, from a health perspective, it looks like maybe if they ate fewer animal foods and more plant foods and more plant protein, they do better. And Wow, actually it's connected to greenhouse gases and other climate change issues. So it would actually be better for the planet and humans if they ate less animal food and more plant food. They submitted their recommendations to the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, said, sorry, too much politics, can't say that. Oh. Not linking to the environment, not saying that. Choose lean meat. That's their response. Ooh, you should get a stop. Okay. 
All right, it's been going on for a long time, but they, they're not really going to get around it because in uh, January of this year, an Eat Lancet Commission, Lancet is the number one selling medical journal, not selling, but most influential, highest impact factor. I've never published there, but you can. Lancet, you're in Lancet yet? I've never been in Lancet. Dang it. Okay, I'm still working on it. They came out with a group of 36 scientists from 17 countries who said, we are screwed if we keep eating this way, and they called for a great food transformation and a planetary health diet with targets. And they said, if we really want to support human health and the environment, we're going to have to eat a whole lot of whole grains and legumes and a lot less meat. And I pulled it off to the left for you and summarized it. They said a goal, a global goal, should be about 80% plant, very little meat, and we're going to toss in a little saturated fat and sugar for you so you can have some fun once in a while. But really, we need a great food transformation to make this happen. Oh my God, where will I get my protein? Are you, I'm surprised you're not shaking in your, in your seats. So I got another quiz question for you. This time I want audience participation. When you're thinking of plants and the protein in plants, which one of these is true? I already dismissed the first one, so let's just focus on the next three. Have you read them yet? Yes. Who votes for two? All plant foods are missing some of the essential amino acids. Who wants to vote for that one? I got one, I got a couple there. How many want to vote for some plants are missing some of the essential amino acids? Okay. How many want to vote for all plants of all 20 amino acids, essential and non-essential, and, and how many didn't vote? Okay. <laughs> totally fine. It's pretty confusing. Okay. So let's go through this. This is a profile of specific amino acids in egg, and it's really good quality protein. It kind of matches the proportions that we need, and I highlighted the essential ones in blue and the non-essential in gray. Non-essential just means you can borrow intermediates from biochemical pathways and hook an amine group on it or something and turn it into amino acid, but the blue ones you gotta get in your diet because you can't make them and you need them for your hair and your heart muscle and your intestinal cells and your enzymes and hormones, okay? But if you, if you look at that place where I sh showed probably how much you require, weren't you? probably close to 40-ish. I like 40 as a number because there's 20 amino acids. And what I think is a lot of people assume that there's 20 amino acids and I need 40 grams of protein, I probably need two of each one, which is completely wrong. It's really more of a distribution. You need some more than others. How many of you have never played Scrabble? Okay, I'll reverse it. How many of you have played Scrabble? Okay. So in Scrabble, you know in that bag there's 100 tiles, and there's 26 letters. And so there's four of every letter, right? No. Yeah. What? No. <laughs> Doesn't it make sense? There'd be four of our, there's 100 tiles, and there's 26 letters in the Amino acids are just like Scrabble. You need different proportions of different letters to make words, and different proportions of different amino acids to make all the proteins in your body. Ha! Ah! I hope you like that parallel. I'm trying to make it come alive for you. So, <laughs> if you want to see how other foods would relate to egg, I've used the same order of amino acids on the bottom. I've got the same coloring of blue and gray. Doesn't it all look very similar between salmon, chicken, beef, pork, egg? They're, all, they're not identical, but they're extremely similar. Okay, now you, I saw all of you say some of the essential amino acids are missing, and so I've, I've sort of drawn something up here for rice, black beans, peanuts, and broccoli. And I, how many of you have a PhD in nutrition science? Oh, excellent. I'm going to get away with good stuff. Okay. All right, so pick. Which one do you think is rice? Which one do you think is black beans? Which one do you think? Eh, trick question. Are you ready? That's rice, black beans, peanuts, and broccoli. Every plant food has all 20 amino acids. I gave this presentation at a California Dietetics Association meeting. There were 500 dietitians in the audience, four senior members in the front row, and 496 junior whippersnappers behind them. Only the four senior dietitians picked four, that all plants have all 20 amino acids. 496 trained dietitians behind them voted for two or three. I don't know where this comes from, but it is a myth that I'm doing my darndest to bust. They're all 
there. But wait, th there's got to be something to this. What about Francis Moore LePay and Diet for a Small Planet? She told me to compliment my beans and rice. And if you look, Google Francis Moore LePay apologizes. Um, <laughs> she wasn't wrong, but what she said isn't really necessary. So the deal is, it's not that they're absent. There are some out of proportion. So in general, grains are a little low in lysine, and beans are a little low in methionine, but the rest of the profile is almost identical. Can you see that in this picture? OK. So I decided to make a heat map of it. So here's sort of all the 20 amino acids for a bunch of animal foods. And you can't possibly see, I don't think, I don't know how good your vision is, the names of some of those foods. But I picked five animal foods. And I showed how, how similar the distribution is if you're considering 100%. And then I did beans. Do beans look more similar or different? Wow, it looks like Kind of similar. Wow, how about grains? What is that? Wow, that looks kind of similar too. Huh. How about nuts? How about veggies? How about fruits? How about, oh my god, they all look the same. What is going on? I don't know why. We have lost sight of this. But all amino acids are in all foods. Now, this is proportion, this is an amount. There's way more protein in animal foods. But the proportion idea is not really an issue, except for the lysine and the methionine. So those are a little low. And then, let's go back to Scrabble a little here. So in Scrabble, pretend you had this old bag and you had lost one of the L's. Well, it turns out sort of that the grains that are low in the lysine are a little high in methionine. They have a little extra. And here's Francis Morlope kicking in. Because if you had another friend and their bag of tiles is really old and they had lost an M, they might have an extra L that they picked up from another bag. And so one of the ideas was that the grains and beans would complement themselves somewhat. There is something to what Francis Morlope said. They're not missing, but they do kind of complement one another. Now, if you've played Scrabble, I bet you can understand this. So you had a bag, you were missing a letter, you can still play the game, you can still put lots of words on this. What if you got to the end and you really were missing one L or one M, and somebody said, I can really help you out. I'll give you a second bag. Mine's missing an L or an M too. How many of the letters can you use in that second bag? Not many, the board is full, right? When you get to the end of Scrabble, it's like, oh, I can't figure out where to put my word. Dang it. Uh, there's no place, this is like your body. You've made all the hair and protein and enzyme and hormones, and so you convert it to carbs and fats because your board is full. Now, it's not that it's unimportant that those are limiting. The limiting part is important. My kid plays with me sometime, and he'll look at his letters and say, Dad, I have the best word. Really? Yeah, I'm just missing one letter, but I can have the points, right? <laughs> no, you don't get the points until you have all the letters. OK, protein is like that. If you're missing any of the amino acids, you can't make the protein. You can't substitute something in there. But it's really unlikely if you have two bags of Scrabble letters that you'd be missing them. Because they're not absent, they're just not in the right proportion. And I'm guessing that as most of you looked sort of at your requirement, you saw that the average American intake is double for the RDA. And the RDA has a safety <coughs> buffer and exceeds the requirement of 97.5% of the population. You're just not short on protein. It's not an issue. But if you want to push me on it, yes, animal foods per 100 calories have much more protein than plants. They really do. But it depends what you're eating. And nobody really eats just rice all day or just beans all day, unless there are some pockets of the world where they have really limited food supplies. They might eat just cassava all day, which is 2% protein, and the quality isn't that great. That would be a problem. But assuming you eat some rice, some beans, some grains, etc., it's all going to work out. And just to make this a little absurd, you could get 40 grams of protein from two cups of edamame. And my kids will eat edamame out of the pot, hand over fist. They love edamame. Or broccoli, OK? This is a little ridiculous. Only 500 calories of, it would be 10 cups. I'd hit 10 cups would be Especially 
when they see me coming, they say, oh, Professor Gardner, we knew you were a vegetarian, and we're having this catered event, and we have all this slop for everybody else, but for you, we got you the raw veggie platter, the ranch dressing. I pick up one of those damn raw broccoli florets, and I try to gag it down, and I just can't, unless I drench it in ranch dressing. But if you just steamed that a little bit and drizzled a little olive oil over it with some slivered almonds, I don't know if I could eat 10 cups. I could eat two or three cups of broccoli, no problem. And nobody's expecting me to get 40 grams of protein from broccoli all day. I would eat a mixture. So how about some black beans in there? 600 calories, two and a half cups would be 40 grams of protein. Not the perfect proportions. It would be low in methionine, but it wouldn't be too bad. So now I'm going to make it come a little more alive for you with these four diets. The first one, we call the Standard American Diet, or SAB, or short. <laughs> Can you imagine anyone eating this way? Yes. Anybody? Yeah. You're right. A lot of people eat this way. Okay. So, that is 125 grams of protein for 2,500 calories. And I don't want to get into this argument with you. But uh, the best data that we have says men eat 3,000 calories a day and women eat 2,400 calories a day to maintain their weight. I know some of the ladies are going to look at me and say, there's no way. I eat 1,200 calories a day and if I eat 1,300, I gain weight. Nope, not in our weight balance studies if we lock you in a room and check everything going in and out of your body. <laughs> it's more than 2,000. So this 2,500 calories, okay, just give me the 2,500 calories. It's a pretty reasonable number. Um, that would be 125 grams of protein, and according to USDA data, Americans eat about 85% of their protein from animal sources and 15 from plant, and it would kind of look like this. Now I've got the essential and the non-essentials in alphabetical order and separated. Once you have achieved those in your diet, all the rest gets turned to carbon fat. So this is what the 125 grams would look like. Okay, so you're going to turn 85 grams of 125, unless you're the super protein kneader, and then you're going to need a few more grams, but most of you are, I know intellectually you're above average, but protein-wise, I suspect most of you are average. <laughs> so what if I modified that SAP diet? So this is 2,500 calories again. Look at it for a minute. Can you, I don't know if you can tell what I did. It's not perfect, but I actually got rid of some of the meat, and I put in some more plants. I got some peanut butter and an apple for a snack, which is a little healthier than the last one. I still have 125-ish grams of protein, but this time I made it 50-50. So, oh my god, I'm missing some meat. My god, I wonder if we'll have enough amino acids. Okay, that's what they look like, almost identical to the last one. How come? Because the plant profile of amino acids is almost identical to animal. Plant and animal are really similar. Okay, so I'm still going to break down a bunch. So now I'm going to go for the enlightened protein shift. I've got this veggie omelet. I've got a chicken salad. I've even got a vegan dinner. I've got some dark chocolate, which I really like. I'm still at 2,500 calories. I don't know if you can tell what I did, but actually now I'm down to 90 grams of protein. And I'm half half. Half animal, half plant. I think you probably require 40. So this is probably more than double what you require right here. So what would that look like if you really did need 40? The green now is what you would break down in this more enlightened stage of your life. But we've got so many people in the room, somebody needs more than that, somebody needs 60. So take every one of the white bars and make them 50% taller. Do they exceed the green? Like if you had gone beyond the green? No, so you actually, the, the most extreme protein meter in the room would be fine with this 90 grams of protein. You still break down 50 and turn it into cognitive fat. So here's a vegan day. So there's no animal product at all in this delicious day of food. Okay, for the sake of time, let's move on. I made it totally delicious. I'm a pretty good cook, actually. And this is 78 grams of protein with no animal products whatsoever. 100% plant. Here's this distribution. Can you take all the white bars and make them 50% taller? Uh, no, actually, you can't. What's going to happen here is you're going to run out of lysine and cysteine, 
even though you might need 40 grams and you ate 78, oh wait, sorry, I just changed it to 60. You might need 60 grams and you ate 78, you ate more total protein than you need. It's not the total that's the right, the important thing, it's the proportions. You have to get the right proportion of every amino acid. And now Francis Moore LePay kicks in, diet for a small planet, complement your grains and your beans, and you'll handle some of that. But really, if you get the two bags of Scrabble, and if you had 100 grams of protein, it wouldn't matter what the quality was, you would have got them all, because they're not missing in any food. They're just in a lower proportion. So I'll let you read the white part on your own. This is out of a classic nutrition textbook, which apparently the dietitians don't study while they're looking at class. Unless it's just cookies and potato chips, it would be a challenge for any of you, I challenge you, to eat enough calories to get by in the day and not meet your protein requirement, even with no animal products whatsoever. You would have to work at it. To make it. So this is in a nutrition textbook. All right, so please stop obsessing about protein. <laughs> If you didn't get clued in, that was my main message there. And all the rest of my topics are shorter, but this is a personal rant that I have been on for <laughs> quite a while now. We actually just published a paper uh, in April linking a request for 25% less protein and 25% shift from animal to plant, and pointed out the greenhouse gas savings and the three trillion gallons of water we'd save in the US. Um, and uh, some colleagues and I also proposed for a new definition of protein quality right now, it's amino acid distribution and digestibility. We think it should be those two. And what kind of food did you get it in? And how much fiber and saturated fat was in the food that you're calling good quality protein? And what is the impact on the environment? And so maybe protein quality should be the food source and the environmental impact and the amino acids and the digestibility. So new call for new definition for protein quality. And let's now go to the other phobia that we've got going on. Oh my god, are carbs really evil? <sighs> okay, so you know how we had that pyramid for a long time and nobody eats off a pyramid and so they finally changed it to a plate? I don't know, some of you might not have even noticed. We used to have a food pyramid, now we have a food plate. Want to try for a pyramid yet? Yes, I'm sorry for the food pyramid. I do. So I agree, people eat off plates, not pyramids. Okay. So let's talk about foods, not colors and icons. So I put foods in all the categories here. Where are the carbs? I've got some people going keto on me. They're not eating any carbs except veggies. So are there carbs and veggies? Yes, oh, there's yes. carbs and veggies. And then the ketogenic diet, <laughs> supposed to be 5% carbs, 75% fat, and 20% protein. You get veggies. Not below ground veggies, God forbid, those are starchy but you can have above ground veggies on a ketogenic diet. All right, so we got that. Are there any uh, carbs in fruit? Yeah, fruits are mostly carbs. Is there any carb in dairy? Well, yeah, the lactose. Okay, are there any carbs in grains? Oh yeah, those are mostly carbs. Okay, and how about that other category, which is usually for meats and things like that, but it also is meats and beans and peas, and so the beans and peas have a lot of carbs. So if you're going to avoid carbs, and you think carbs are evil, what the hell are you going to eat? <laughs> There's nothing left except meat and oil. So this, this thing is driving me crazy when people are saying carbs are horrific. So I actually have colleagues that I respect across the spectrum. I'm a pretty open-minded person. I have a keto friend, and a vegan friend, and a Mediterranean friend, and, and there's lots of different themes out there for diets. And I have noticed, I actually got to moderate a debate between Lauren Cordain doing the paleo diet, Joel Furman doing the vegan diet, and Mimi, forget her last name, where she's an acolyte of uh, Dean Ornish, but she was pushing the Mediterranean, and they bickered, and they cherry-picked studies, and they said, mine is better than yours, and yours is wrong. And at the end, I said, I'm the moderator. I just heard you all disagree. Can you tell me what you agree on? Let's stop bickering over what you disagree on. So tell me what you all agree on for the audience's sake. And they came up with some common themes. They all were stunned at how much freaking added sugar is in the US diet. And that's all carbs. So both the low fat and the low carb, everybody was against that. Okay, and then they said, oh, so much white wheat flour, bread, pizza crust, bagels, Danish pastry, cookies, ah! So much white wheat flour. Everybody was against that on all camps. And then when we got to veggies, they said, oh, yeah, we all want people to eat more veggies. 
And so I actually got him to say, yeah, I, we think more than half the American diet has added sugar and white flour in it, and Americans don't eat nearly enough veggies. And could they get rid of all the added flour and white sugar and fill the veggies? That would actually be pretty tough. So I said, feel free to disagree on the rest, but I wish if we could get Americans to cut back on the added sugar and white flour and double or triple their veggies, we would solve many of the nutritional problems. Are. And you all agree on that right now, and yet you're bickering about the stuff at the periphery. Let's see if we could get the foundation right. Whole foods, not ultra-processed, hyper-palatable, but whole foods, veggies, whole grains, etc. I got a lot of agreement on that. So I made up my own carbohydrate pyramid. Just to not to... I know it's a pyramid, I should put it on a plate. All right, so don't look at that very much because I totally made that up. But the other thing about all those sources of carbohydrates is they come with fiber. And fiber is a hot deal right now. And I would love to get a shout out to my friends, the Sonnenbergs, who are studying your who. Yeah, I'm not apologizing. I'm totally unapologetic about poop. We collect poop all the time. We have people all over the Bay Area with poop in their freezers that they have told their parents not to touch so they can bring it in for our studies. Be proud of your poop in the freezer. So, you list Justin Sonnenberg. He's an incredible speaker. You guys should get him hooked up. Um, he and his wife, Erica, are phenomenal speakers. And they're brilliant scientists. And they've done global research, and they really think almost all of it is about fiber going to the microbiome. The very definition of fiber is that you, you can't break it up with enzymes. You can't absorb it in your small intestine. So it all goes to your colon. That's part of the definition. And then the microbiome feeds off that. And that you've got this um, mucus lining in your large intestine that protects you from nasty things getting through. And the mucus lining is made of carbohydrate-like substances. And if you're not feeding it fiber, those bacteria will start eating and thinning your mucus lining, and it's being linked to leaky gut syndrome and inflammation. So with this big phase of, oh, carbophobia, I'm not eating any carbs, but I sure am eating meat because I need a lot of protein. <laughs> this is like a double whammy on fiber and the microbiome. I think both of these are going in exactly the wrong direction right now. So we have national recommendations in the US to get 30 to 40 grams of fiber a day. The national intake is half that. Okay, this drives me nuts. We have protein recommendations, and you guys are doubling, and tripling, and quadrupling it. And then you buy protein powder, and protein bars, and protein water, and protein peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, and then you're not getting enough fiber to say, oh, I'm going to have less, because I'm going to go keto. I don't know, please have your fiber. Justin studies uh, hunter-gatherer tribes, and some of them get more than 100 grams of fiber a day. So if you're gonna complain about flatulence from your 20 grams of fiber a day, just get over it, because there's places all over the world where they acclimate, and they eat way more fiber than we ever did, and they have beautiful microbiome. Just ask Justin and Erica. So, I don't get any money for this plug, but the good gut, is a fabulous um, layperson book that they put together. It sort of explains all the pros and cons. A bunch of fabulous recipes at the end. Their whole family just eats a very microbiome-oriented diet, and, and they talk all about it. OK, so I did those. Um, the next ones go even quicker. Uh, I'm just going to do GMOs to show you sort of another side of nutrition, right? So how many of you remember, you all, all lived here for a while, was it Prop 37 to um, label foods the GMOs? How many of you voted? Which way did you vote? Did you vote yes or no? Actually, don't commit. I don't care. It got defeated. Do you remember? When it first came out, everybody, yes, let's label GMOs. And then when it came time for the vote, said, no, don't label GMOs. It's really confusing. The industry gave us this information. Yes, we should, but it's not the right way to do it. And we voted it down. So I think you remember that. All right, so why did we want to label it? What do you really know about GMOs? When I ask people, they really don't know what the heck they're talking about. And so I teach a class, and I didn't know either. I actually teach a class called Food and Society, and this is one of our topics. I've taught it for a decade now. I only know because I assign it, and the students look at it, and they tell me what they found. So now I am an expert in GMO, okay? <laughs> so genetically modified organisms, maybe there's a label for Actually, there is a new label, and it's horrifically misleading. It's like a smiley face in a plant, and it's called uh, genetic engineering. No, it's, it's bio. Anyway, there's a new icon for it. It's a bit ridiculous. 
<clears throat> and really what was touted for a long time is this. Oh my god, we're taking some food, and we're taking, so you know the, the true definition of GMO is you take the DNA of another species and put it in the thing that you're growing. That is the definition. It's not hybridization, which we've been doing for thousands of years, taking plants and crossbreeding. That's not GMO. GMO is genetically modifying it by taking the DNA of another species and inserting it into that. So, so we have these ideas, oh, there's fish or frog or tadpole DNA in my tomato. Okay. What they don't really talk about is things like a vitamin A deficiency in the Philippines where they thought, well, I wonder if there's a way that we could modify the rice so that it would overproduce beta carotene, which is a precursor for vitamin A, and we could actually resolve a nutritional deficiency with some crop growing technology, and it would involve genetic engineering. And they made golden rice, and it actually does this. Do you know which species they got the DNA from? Yes, daffodil. How upset are you that they put daffodil DNA in rice. I'm not really all that upset. <laughs> and some soil back. It's not the same as putting tadpole DNA or some bizarre thing. So anyway, this actually has not worked. There's been a cultural revulsion of this thing, and it hasn't been accepted. There's been all kinds of misinformation. And so they spent billions of dollars on this, and they've had people tearing down the fields of golden rice because the fear of GMO that I think is largely unfounded. So. The biggest one that we'll hear about in the U.S. is Monsanto and Ready Roundup and corn and glyphosate, and that's a whole separate topic in and of itself. It's, uh, it, you can ask me more questions later. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but the reason that one reason they came up with it, the rationale was that if you grow the corn with this insecticide in it, then when the um, bugs are coming to um, eat your corn they'll implode and you won't have to spray more pesticide. You'll actually cut way back on the pesticide you have to use on the corn if we use this genetically modified corn. And then you have to ask yourself, so who's afraid of the pesticides? Are you or your kids? Are you taking stuff home and washing it? There's sort of EPA approved levels for what's a tolerable amount of pesticide and insecticide and fungicide. And how did they figure out it was tolerable? Do we have any lifelong studies, not really, but you know, at some level, uh, part of the issue is will we have enough food? So if farmers are out there and something's eating all their plants, or the weeds are taken over, we won't have enough food. So it, it made sense. There are various kinds of pesticides, and it made sense that maybe this ready roundup would mean less pesticide. I'm actually not as interested in you and your kids, sorry, on this one. I'm more interested in the farm workers. Those are the ones who suffer the worst consequences of the excessive use of pesticide in the food system. They're exposed to it all the time, or the people who live in the neighborhoods where this kind of things happen, because it blows in the wind. It's not you and the, how much was on your apple, it's the people exposed to it on a daily basis. So I'm all for less of that, and I'm all for less runoff, because as we excessively use pesticides, it runs off on our depleted soils, and it goes into rivers, and we have dead zones in the Gulf Coast. So there's a reason for less pesticide, and so if GMO created that possibility, I would be for that. So there's some possible yays for that. How about yield? One of the ideas was, oh, we have 10 billion people, how are we going to feed them? Oh, we need more yield per hectare. And so I don't even know what the heck a hectare is, but um, eight, let's say acres. Um, so here's, if you talk to the GMO people, they say, yes, we've increased yield. And if you talk to the Union of Concerned Scientists, they'll say, no, you didn't really. The most interesting comparison I just saw was the US versus Europe. Europe banned GMO. If you look at the increase in yield in Europe and the increase in yield in the US, they are absolutely parallel. Without GMOs, they have achieved the same increase in yield that we have in the US with GMO. I am not impressed with the yield. So if that's your question, I would say no. That's not really very helpful. But which kind of yield? So the yield I think they're looking for is 10% more or 15% more. How about 100% more? Because there's multiple places in the world where a blight has wiped out a crop, and one of them was eggplant in Bangladesh. Another one was papaya in Hawaii. Another one was banana in Africa. And they have come up with genetically modified crops that deal with the blight that was wiping the crop out. So we're not talking about an incremental 10% increase talking about a crop or not. 
zero crop or revitalizing that. So look into papayas in Hawaii, bananas in Africa, and Bangladesh, uh, the um, eggplant there. And this is a New York Times op-ed where some person super opposed to GMO visited Bangladesh and saw that this GMO solution had saved the crop of this staple food in Bangladesh. And so that's a different kind of yield if you're going to save a crop from total wipeout. If it's the US, it's not really eggplant, it's corn and soy. And so I'm, I'm not a big fan of GMO in the US because the people don't eat the soy and they don't eat the corn. They grow the corn and soy and then they make a lot of crap out of it. They break it into products and make chips and snacks and candies. And so I'm not up for that. I'm also not up for this idea that to get their money back from the investment they put into it, they sell the seeds and the farmer has to repurchase the seeds every year. And so instead of saving your seeds, which is illegal, you have to buy your seeds again. And so we have some cases now where seeds have blown, has been drift and went from one farmer to the other. And Monsanto has been suing the farmer across the street for using their GMO seeds. But in fact, they didn't even want to. They went non-GMO on purpose. Yes? If you go back a slide, uh, aren't the majority of these crops that we grow here in the US, they're, they're not intended for us to use less pesticide. They're actually genetically modified so that they can spray with more pesticides. No, so the idea, well, the corn in particular is if you use Ready Roundup, you won't have to use anything else. Less frequent and less volume of pesticides. That is the rationale. It will differ crop by crop. So really, at the end of the day, I just want to get here so I can finish up. And everybody says GMO, are you opposed or for it? I think the first thing you have to ask is which crop, which country? And then you ask, is it a nutritional question, a yield question, a farm worker health issue. So when we wanted to label GMO in California, I don't think anybody could have answered that question. They were not thinking that way. They're just like, oh, frankenfood, yes, I definitely want to know this. It's much more nuanced than that, right? So that, that's my main point. I don't have the solution for you, but it's more nuanced. I read some of the glyphosate, the, is it the toxic dose of glyphosate is actually the most toxic part of the formulation of the detergent. So when they spread these pesticides, they mix it with detergents, so it spreads. So and people use detergents in their washing powders. And okay. Or their so I'm going to get you to come up to the podium, maybe not today, but I don't know that much. So it's about dis distribution and disbursement and detergents and putting like so. There's more to it. They just labeled it as carcinogenic. It's actually not working anymore. So we got uh, resistant bugs and plants, whatever, that are growing up against the glyphosate. So it's pretty complicated. I don't have time to do it now. But OK, so there's a detergent issue that I, I learned a new thing tonight. Thanks. Yes, one more? Um, isn't it true that it takes 50 years for people to study what a GMO specifically does to the population? And by that time, most of us are going to be dead. Why are we even putting them in? Yeah, it's a great point. It's a really hard thing to study. Like, you can't do a study on it because it's already a natural experiment. It's so widespread. It would be almost impossible to study, unless you look at this Europe-US thing. It's sort of a natural experiment. OK, I'm going to move on so I can finish this up. I'm just going to talk about organic really quick. Stanford, uh, a while back, did this uh, meta-analysis of organic. and. At the end, they found that it wasn't what everybody thought it was, and they published it. The New York Times said organic. Stanford said it isn't worth it. Stanford got 70,000 letters from the public demanding that the article be retracted from the journal, from the Annals of Internal Medicine. Did you know that Stanford is not in charge of the Annals of Internal Medicine? <laughs> it's an independent medical journal, and it was not retracted, and it really was a pretty good study. Uh, but boy, people, we got them viscerally with that. What? That money I'm spending on organic, it must be worth it because I've been spending all that money. <laughs> Again, it kind of depends what question that you're asking. So, I mean, look at these beautiful heirloom organic tomatoes in season versus that stupid airport salad that you used to get. Did you notice airport salads are way better now? So I can't actually use this slide much longer. They are better. But what about those unripe, unflavorful tomatoes? Don't you want the organic, seasonal one? That's better. Or look how convenient they've made. Somehow they grow small carrots now. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. Actually, they shave these down, and they create an incredible amount of waste. Okay? And the packaging for the lettuce is insanely inefficient. Go buy a head of lettuce. 
don't get it in this packet. Anyway, they made it super convenient, and acres of organic farms are going up, and my wife brought this home for me the other day, not to feed our kids, just to be outraged. This is a, <laughs> a wholesome alternative traditional snack. Okay, I know it has like seven words, but the first ingredient is sugar. <laughs> It doesn't exactly say sugar, but it is. It doesn't then. It's sugar. How can that be a healthy, wholesome, alternative snack? Oh my god. And organic, not holy flour, organic flour. This is white flour and sugar. Seriously? Oh, but it's organic. Oh. And how many of you wouldn't just feel like you'd be warming your physician's heart if you said, so what did you have for breakfast yesterday? <gasps> Doc, I had low-fat organic yogurt. Oh. I must be doing the right thing. Okay, so in my store, there's kind of one tiny little row of plain, and about 50 rows of guava, pineapple, cherry, guava, pineapple, cherry, mango, apple, persimmon. Okay, so the one on the left has three ingredients, and the one on the right is raspberry yogurt, so it should have four, shouldn't it? The three ingredients and raspberries. It doesn't. Apparently, they're not very colorful, so they add color. It's not very tasty, so they add flavor. And it's not very sweet, so they add, oh my god, this is like a sugar delivery system. The one on the right has 50% more calories. Why? Sugar. This is a sugar delivery system. So if you're going to buy plain organic yogurt, go to the farmer's market, and get the damn raspberries yourself, and put them on top, and you'll be much better off. It's not great that it's organic, low-fat yogurt. Let's not even go to low-fat right now. And so you can stay organic on any day. So the organic point is, to be honest, if it was two bean crops or two cereal crops or two vegetable crops, there are environmental benefits for going organic. There actually aren't too many nutritional benefits. It's really the same nutrients. And the sad thing is, it's really easy to gain the system and to meet the minimum guidelines and to have an organic coat, as opposed to being a snooty Palo Alto and going to the California Ave Farmer's Market, walking up to the vendor and saying, are you organic? And they say no, but before they finish the sentence, the snooty Palo Alto has walked away because it's not organic. And what you hear the farmer say is, but I actually exceed all of the organic standards. I don't have the money for certifications. It's a three-year process. So if you do go to the farmer's market and it doesn't say organic, ask. Ask how they grow their food. So the organic label is not just a simple sign that it's better. Farming is more complicated than that. So look a little deeper, okay? All right, I'd love to have your questions. I'm just going to wrap up and say that I now teach a class where we don't talk about nutrition at all. All we talk about is animal rights and welfare, global warming and climate change, and human labor abuses in slaughterhouses, fast food workers, and the agricultural system. And we've actually published a study showing that this class seems to have more of an impact than my 20 years of feeding and bleeding organic soy and garlic and whatever. Um, the Journal of American Journal of Preventive Medicine published this where we said we avoided talking about health, we only talked about social external causes, and the young students who were really into food justice and social justice all talked about going vegetarian, all talked about eating less fast food, all talked about cooking more, and we, because it's science, we had a graph, see this graph, this is a good graph, and we had a p-value, see the p-value, that's science? Okay. You don't even have to be a scientist. I mean, this is a terrible study. They self-selected in our class. This is, I don't know if they really ate what they said they did. I don't know if that persisted at all. It was a pre-post questionnaire. I'm sure they wanted a better grade. And so they said, oh, what did I say in the beginning? I bet if I say I ate better at the end, I'll get a better grade. So why did this journal take this horrifically designed paper? And I think the answer is, we need some paradigm shifts here. Like we've been banging people over the head with grams of fiber and milligrams of antioxidants. And it often does not lead to lasting behavior change. And the group that I work with at the Stanford Prevention Research Center is all about diet, exercise, and tobacco control. But the overarching emphasis of what we do is behavior change. 
And so I think from a behavior change perspective, if you look at Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, I think the dilemma is there's too much freaking food to choose from. It's crazy. It's driving us nuts. And I used to give one-hour lectures on all of these. And I now start talking about food in a completely different way. And when I do, and when I teach this class, and I listen to what the students, what's resonating with them, they tell me all the things they're doing, and it cracks me up, because they're doing all the things I wanted them to do from a health perspective, but I'm not talking health. I'm talking about the whole food system and all the different angles. And so one of my favorite stories is at the end of the class, I said, you know, we don't want to repeat the bad readings, we want to keep the good ones. What was your favorite reading? And one student with tears in her eyes says, oh, I, I found out what they do to the animals, and I don't like it, and so I went vegetarian. And then the student next to her said, I, I grew up on a ranch. We don't treat our animals like that at all. We treat them super well. And so I, but I didn't know the greenhouse gas impact. I only get grass-fed just like my family used to do. And I, I now look into who does grass-fed pasture-raised. And the kid next to them said, well, I don't know. I think climate change is a hoax. I think that's all hooey. But you know, I, as I understand the fast food industry, they don't actually make their money from selling burgers. The franchisers buy all the burgers, and McDonald's and Wendy's, they get rent from all those places. Their money is real estate holders, and so the franchisers get small business loans, and if they go under, because there's a story in one of our books, of 13 Wendy's opening in Harlem, and 10 go under, and none of the small business loans get repaid. And so this fiscally responsive person said, that's it, I am not eating at fast food restaurants anymore. <laughs> this is gonna lead to a fiscal crisis. There is no climate change, but there is a fiscal crisis. <laughs> Okay, wait, we didn't talk about health at all, and you went vegetarian, and you're only eating grass-fed, and you won't eat at fast food anymore. Oh my god, I have been doing the wrong thing for 20 years of my life. This rocks! Okay, so I've been finding that some of the external social motivators for behavior change lead to some of the same behavior changes I wanted all along, for grams of fiber and milligrams of antioxidants. So. I will end on the note that my group has uh, got an observational study going. We have 4,000 people again. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any retention at all right now. <laughs> but we got four people that sign up to be followed for the well registry. I'm actually not sure if that icon works in. Oh, it's even covered up, so you can't click on it on your phone. Sorry, it's okay. I don't, I don't need to fix it, no. But if you just go to Well for Life, um, we talk about a lot of these issues in Well for Life. What we're trying to do is set up a group of people that will follow for a long time, but ask to be participants in studies. So a lot of observational cohorts, you intentionally try not to contaminate the group. You want them to just do what they do. What they do. We totally want to contaminate them. We want them to sign up for our studies all the time, and we'll collect data on who's changing what, and still follow them for years to come. Like for one of my weight loss studies, I, I always publish, here's how much they lost a year later. And somebody said, so how much did they keep off 10 years later? I said, I, I, I don't have those data. So one of the goals would be we would keep tracking people in our studies so we'd have long-term follow-up. So that's what I tried to tell you today to spark some questions. If you want to see what studies we have going on, go to nutrition.stanford.edu. We're doing one of the fake meats, Beyond Meat versus Red Meat. We're delivering it. Oh, I'm not sure if I can say that to this group. Can they do studies? OK. All right, so we're doing that, fake meat versus real meat. We're doing ketogenic versus Mediterranean for type 2 diabetics and pre-diabetics. And for adults over 60, we're giving them a prebiotic. Uh, and it's, it's, we're looking at the microbiome so you can poop even more. For, oh, maybe we can have cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and give us our poop first. OK, you got to give him his poop. So we'll give you two vials. Thank you very much for listening. I'll take as many questions. Yes. So I'm athletically active, and I want to get stronger. And so for a while, I was raising my uh, protein intake uh -huh. with uh, cheese snacks and protein powder. Uh -huh. But it interfered with my kidney function, which was really oh. serious. We got you know yeah. diabetes in the family history, so I stopped it. But in building muscle at age 73, am I trying to climb up too steep a hill? No, you can build muscle, you can. And it, but it's all about working out, it's really not about the protein. So I teach human nutrition to undergraduates. There's actually a meta-analysis about men over 40 need 1.6 grams a kilogram of protein per day to build muscle, not 0.8. Nowhere in the article did it say that's what Americans eat anyway. Uh -huh. 
And then if you're being athletic enough and working out enough to build muscle, you don't eat 2,500 calories a day. You eat 4,000 calories a day. I have a Rose Bowl football player in my class, 6,000 calories a day, Torres Camarado. 300 grams of protein a day. Wow. He, and he's not trying to eat three, he just eats 6,000 calories and it has 300 grams of protein. That's not what's, it's not the protein that's slowing it down. I actually had all 50 students take one paper each in the meta-analysis to see if it backed up the claim. It didn't even back up the claim. The studies were weak. Interesting, it said um, beyond 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, there's no additional benefit. So don't go over that. What it failed to note was that that's what they were eating anyway. And so the protein supplementation beyond that wasn't helping. So I, would, I don't think that protein's holding you back. But as we get older, it is you get more injured as you're going to do enough of a workout to gain muscle. So you can. Okay. Thank you. How about that? My children yell at me if I give my grandchildren ice cream or such. They it should. be an argument <laughs> to, to, to tell them why I give them ice cream. An argument why, they, why you should give them ice cream? Yes. So one of the arguments that I will give is we have to bring the joy back to food. <laughs> the nutrition community has done a horrible job at just shaming people about food. So one of my most fun partners right now is the, uh, I'm on the advisory board of the CIA. It doesn't look like it, does it? Yeah. So the Culinary Institute of America, not the board, CIA uh, has a group called Menus of Change, and Menus of Change is, is using chefs as a force of deliciousness going forward, and one of the themes is to promote and elevate the unapologetic deliciousness of food. Like we have lost the joy in food, and that's their craft, and interestingly, one of the things that they're, one of their main themes right now is the protein flip, which they got from the dessert flip. So I'm going to get back to your ice cream in just a second here, but they had a dessert flip. They said, here's this massive piece of cheesecake with a raspberry on top. How about a bowl of raspberries with a dollop of cheesecake on top? <laughs> and then they say, you took my cheesecake away. I didn't. It's right there. <laughs> they're trying to do the same thing with protein. Instead of having chicken or beef in the middle of the plate, and instead of doing vegan or vegetarian, which is often polarizing, they have a global fusion of flavors with grains and legumes, and they've got seared vegetables and strips of beef or strips of chicken or strips of fish or pork, but only two ounces. And they've made it this fabulous global fusion of flavors and they're bringing in all the herbs and spices and making it global. Now the ice cream, yes, what's the portion? What's the frequency? You should celebrate sometimes. Food is often used for celebration. So um, I don't know how often you offer the grandkids uh, <laughs> ice cream. So do we want to go there? I <laughs> So they should have ice cream, yeah. And they should eat whatever the hell you eat, because you don't look old enough to be a grandmother. So let's go there. Yes? So if I go to Trader Joe's and go to the non-organic counter rack, uh -huh. now, how should I clean it? If you get a non, well you should, technically you should wash all the food that you get because of all the handling that it got. Then I mean, how do you wash it? Just in plain water? I do. Some people have uh, detergent-like things that they spray on their veggies. Um, really, if it was Justin Sonnenberg in the room, he would tell you to drop it on the floor and then eat it. <laughs> so one of the things that we've suffered is this obsession with hygiene. And that's probably part of the reason that we've messed up our microbiome and we've scraped all the dirt off the carrots and we've steamed everything and cleaned it all. and. Now we're really susceptible to some, to some minor things that help, help us build up our immunity and increase our microbial diversity. So I, you know, the, my best advice for you is actually to go to the Environmental Working Group. The Environmental Working Group has a website where they have the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. And the dirty dozen are the veggies and fruits that are most likely to have the most pesticide on them. And the clean 15 don't. And if you like things in both categories, just say, ah, Here's the one in the dirty dozen that I could replace with the one from the clean 15, and then I wouldn't be that obsessed with the pesticide. So just the Environmental Working Group, EWG. Apples are on the dirty dozen this year. Yeah. Okay, and apples are. But again, it's going to depend which apple, which farmer, which crop. 
Okay, and I don't know. How, okay, I get at least till seven. There's another like ten more minutes, I think. And you guys pull the hook and grab me. One, two, three. I'll try it. one. Okay, John. Uh, the kids nowadays are uh, many of them are skin allergic. Yes. When I raised my oh. kids thirty years ago, you don't find one kid in the whole school with a kid allergic. So do you think these are all related to the food we are eating nowadays? Yep, I do. And really, the best person on campus to look to is Kari Nado. Um, she got a $25 million food allergy center funded the Sean Parker Allergy Center. I believe she is just phenomenal, and she's been curing kids with multiple food allergies. And part of it is very small exposure in multiple doses, and then continued on and on and on. Yes, it is frightening. At my kids' elementary school, there was one allergy table to avoid nuts, and then four, and now every other table practically is uh, don't have any nuts at this table kind of thing. And, so she's really tired of treating the symptoms after they happen, and really part of it is probably what we've done with the food supply. And I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it brings to mind gluten intolerance and wheat. Is wheat really that bad for us? I think when you only grow one kind of wheat and you refine it and you put it in everything, wheat is a problem. I think if you maybe grow one kind of peanut, maybe there were more varieties. You know, in the agricultural world, a lot of things had multiple varieties, which was great, because then if a blight walked out, wiped out one, you had others. As far as I know, BT corn is the only thing we grow. We used to have 12 varieties of corn. If that thing gets wiped out, we're screwed for corn and for a bunch of things like that. So diversity, I think. Exposure when you're a kid. Like, apparently there's a lot of fear of raising an infant with things like peanuts, and one of the cures is feeding it early on. But don't quote me, Kari Nido is the expert, and she's on our campus. So I would just look up Kari Nido and her food allergy um, site. Otherwise, I'd be doing her an injustice. Walter. Are there health benefits to periodic fasting? I think there are spiritual health benefits. I'm not <laughs> sure that there are any nutritional health benefits to fasting. I have an associate right now who's going through Ramadan, and so she's fasting for a month from sun up to sundown every day. Uh, and I have people doing the intermittent fasting thing, which I can't answer that question if you have, because there's so many different kinds. There's fast for two days and eat for five. There's fast for this particular hour block during the day. You know, your, your body wants a constant source of fuel and nutrients. I think when you do those fasting rituals, it's more spiritual than nutritional. I, I, I can't document any harm that you're doing, but I, I can only imagine, especially the way some people are doing it. I'm sure they do it in different ways. Like, how do you break that fast when you're done? Are you breaking it in a way where you get some nutrients being slowly absorbed versus breaking it with a Diet Coke or a Coca-Cola? So I'm not very good at answering the fasting question just because we don't have a lot of data on it. So my knee jerk would be it's more for spiritual health than um, physiological health. No, I have one way in the back and then I'll go there. Yes, you. What do, you, what do you do for muscle? Uh, what is your muscle workout? How do you get more muscle? How do you get more muscle? Yeah, you burn, you sweat, you have to work. What do you do? What, what's the best workout for muscle? But I'm not trying to gain muscle. I'm going to be 60 years old in six weeks. I can do 60 push-ups, 10 pull-ups. I ride the bike, my bike work four days a week. Play volleyball two days a week. I'm going to run a half marathon in South Dakota on June 2nd, and I eat a lot of veggies. <laughs> I'm vegan. I have chickens in my, actually, I just got rid of the chickens in my backyard. So I eat some eggs. So, I mean, it's whatever, really honestly, it's the thing that works best for you that you can do long term. So I think the way people screw up is they get really excited, and they're going to do something, and they really don't like it, but they're stoic, and then it doesn't last. So if walking is good for you, if jogging, if swimming is an elliptical, one of those devices. I know some people do a lot better at a gym or in a group where if you feel, oh, I'm responsible to the group, I'm going to let my group down if I don't go. There's really a lot of really interesting options out there, but it, it's got to be very personal. I, I would say go the thing that you enjoy the most so it lasts the longest. Sorry if that's a cop out. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sorry I'm neglecting this side, but I got a lot of questions over here. I'll take you just to balance out the room in just a second. Yes? The Sonnenberg book talks about fasting at night or not eating for like 10 hours to let your system. I read it, but I can't remember the whole thing. They did? Yeah. 
I love the sound of birds. Okay. <laughs> sort of unwind and sleep. So the idea is the intermittent fast would be overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things I like about that is so if the fast was I ate dinner and then I didn't snack and I didn't eat till breakfast the next morning, that would work wonders for many people because they blow it at night. Why the hell would you need energy at 10 at night when you're about to go to bed? And how many calories do we have between 9 p.m. and when we go to bed? I know people who chow down on lots of stuff and say, oh, I eat so healthfully, I hardly eat any calories at all except for the pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream that I had to have. <laughs> that was just a slip, it was just a slip. Usually I'm really good, except, and then the next night it's a couple cookies and the next night something else. So if you had dinner and you fasted till breakfast, I, I'm down. I'm down for that one. So uh, I don't know the specifics, but you made some nutritional recommendations. Um, uh, why did you stop at only a 25 percent shift from animal protein to plant protein? It was why just to model it. Thanks for the question. So what we were doing was modeling it. So if you wanted to go 30, 40, 50 percent, um, we could model the whole thing. We were just saying, I bet you a lot of people would tolerate that as opposed to let's make everybody vegan. That's just not going to work. And so, you could, yeah, so the 25% things were just multipliers. Really, it came about because I was giving a talk, and I did like an eight-minute version of that protein thing, and I showed the amino acids, and everybody's jaw was on the floor. And they said, no. And I said, yes. And the moderator said, that was so cool. We should do this 25-25 thing. Let's write a paper. And so we did. And it was his idea that I thought, 25-25, that's pretty cool. That would be a nice thing, and then you could make it more if you wanted, and you could model the impact of doing more. Okay, one here and one there. Yes? Microwave versus steaming vegetables? Ah, yeah, I don't have a great answer for microwave versus steaming. Um, steaming's pretty handy. There's, there's nothing wrong with steaming. You always lose a little bit of nutrient when you heat something. There's some things that degrade. But again, if you steam that broccoli, I can eat way more than those damn broccoli florets, so I'm off of that. <laughs> As far as I know, the microwave is awesome, right? I, I've never really seen any data that there's a downside to it, and it's fast, and part of reality here is that people are pressed for time, and so instead of getting this steaming little tray out and putting the water in, if you put it in the microwave for 40 seconds, and you ate better, I mean, my question is always when students ask me if something good is, I say, what would you eat instead? said, well, since you told me that that microwave was bad for me, I went out and got a Big Mac. I said, moron, I didn't mean it was that bad for you. I, just, I meant sauteing it would, you know, would be best, and microwaving it might be worse, even though I didn't say that. And then they, you know, they take it this next step. No, I, I think the microwaving and the steaming are both pretty good options. I have nothing bad to say about microwaves, but I don't have any data to prove that they're good. Yes. What percent of the population really has gluten intolerance? Is it ah. Bad or is it so you know, for the gluten intolerance thing, so if we're talking celiac disease, it's really small, so that's full blown, and that's less than 1%. Uh, I got a 2012 paper that I use in my nutrition class. They did a, a pretty extensive survey. It was, it was less than 1%, and interestingly, half the ones they found were undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. Undiagnosed celiac. And so how bad can it be if it's undiagnosed? And then for gluten intolerance, I do think that's real, but it's a continuum. And I, I don't know what the proportion is. The, the thing that I like, so let me, let me see if I can spin this the right way. Oh, you're gluten intolerant? Oh, no more pizza crust, no more donuts, no more white bread, no more bagels for you. I'm really looking out for you. I think you should have more quinoa and veggies, and lentil soup, and then my problem is they go and get a power, a gluten-free power protein bar instead, because they're gluten intolerant. So I think there's different ways you can take that. Globally, we are bizarre in the US how much wheat we use. So there are other things that are way more popular in other countries, quinoa, amaranth, teff, uh, oats, sorghum, all kinds of things that other people like. So I, I, I'm okay if you get off of the wheat for um, gluten intolerance, even if you're not. Uh, so I don't have a good answer of how many really are. I do think it's increasing. I think it's because of our food system. One can somebody question. throw me a low, uh, a softball? Mm -hmm. One I can really answer. You've got it for me, right? This is it. Worry about vitamins and essential elements in our diet. 
worried about vitamins and essential minerals. Yeah, you get them all in food. Unless you don't have access to enough food, so who should take a multivitamin and multimineral? That should be a med student who's not eating, they're um, working 24 hour shifts, and they're only using the snack bar. It's my picky kid when he was five who wouldn't eat anything, so we gave him a multivitamin. It's a population that works in an area, lives in an area where they don't have access to food, and so a multivitamin and multimineral will benefit. But in Palo Alto, if you have access to a diverse diet, you should be able to get all your nutrients from whole foods, and I hope you go eat a lot of them and eat them in an unapologetically delicious way. Thanks for having me.